so just can you uh, just very quickly introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and what your seat number was on this flight? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Shiel Manat. I'm a venture capitalist out of San Francisco, run a fund called Better Tomorrow Ventures, and I'm sitting in 20G. How's the flight been? Good. I actually uh, did not get much sleep last night. So I fell asleep as soon as we got on the flight and Nick woke me up to uh, come back here. Oh, did he just wake you up? (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. No, 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 no. It's great. Uh, Yeah. Happy to do it. Cool. So the the thing that I just talked to Nick about that I want to talk to you about as well is like, I'm an American guy who's lived in South Africa for five years and just generally interested and intrigued by those who are based in the U.S. but are interested in what's happening here. And I'm certainly very interested in the degree to which um, like that opportunity or, or those bridges can be built even further. And you're obviously a guy who is very much interested in what's happening in emerging markets in Africa in particular. So I'm, I'm just curious to get like your perspective on why that is, how that how that happened, like what sorts of things are, are um, driving your interest and, and compelling you to get on flights from San Francisco to Kenya, then down to Cape Town. Yeah, for sure. So I've always been interested in emerging markets, and um, it was actually one of my um, one of my mentors. This guy C.K. Prella. He wrote this book called "The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid" many years ago, and then he and I worked together and wrote a bunch of stuff together. He unfortunately passed away in 2010, but um, he, you know, he he gave me three pieces of advice. It, one of them was. Um, work in emerging markets, work on hard problems, and then write about it. And I I haven't been writing at all, but... Um, <laughs> you follow two of three, I guess, yeah, right? May, maybe, maybe just one. But uh, but um, I, I also just like traveling and, and learning about different places. Mm. And um, and then my own sort of fintech background starts in India. I, I was working in microfinance in India. And so, you know, I sort of saw firsthand the challenges that people face mm-hmm. and realize, you know, there's a huge opportunity also in solving these problems. And um, the demographics of Africa are such that I think there's a huge opportunity for the next, you know, so many years. Mm-hmm. And your counterparts in Silicon Valley, I, I suspect, well, not I suspect, I mean, it definitely the interest and the intrigue and the activity is increasing yeah. there, there as well. And so like what's what's happening in the circles when you're, you know, out to breakfast with someone in San Francisco and someone's like, why did you just go to Kenya? I mean, like what how is the perception changing and how has it changed over time? Well, it changed so rapidly. Um, you know, I, I was, I guess, like a little bit early to it. I started um, investing in Africa in 2016, seven, 17, maybe. So not like that early, but but a little bit, you know, 2017 to 2019, there like it was kind of dark, um, as you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the companies I invested in then like really, really struggled to raise the next round. And um, actually, so so um, one of them is Chipper Cash, which is now obviously very successful. They have not struggled to raise. But actually, they the did. The yeah, they did. So, um, you know, they made a list of Series A investors they wanted to meet. And then, you know, I introduced them or I tried to introduce them. And almost every single person was like, I'm not investing in Africa. And they were like, well, there just hasn't been any success stories yet. Um, and then it's also like, if you haven't done it, you haven't seen success there and you don't want to get in a plane. Yeah. And so a lot of things have changed, to your point, um, in the last two years with COVID and and the success stories. So now that we have a handful of unicorns on the on the continent, um, that has changed. Uh, that has changed things a bit. And then um, COVID obviously changed things as well, where um, you don't have to get on a plane as much anymore. Like board meetings used to always be in person that I went to, and now most of them are on zoom and you know there was a time when you didn't even meet a founder that was in the same city as you because you couldn't and it was all on zoom so people are much more comfortable with it than they were before yeah um and actually just today i had lunch with a founder that we led the seed round of and i had never met him before today nice 
Yeah. And and um, I certainly believe this to be true, but in in your work and and in the U.S. investing, I mean, do you think that having a wide aperture and do you, do you think that having a wide aperture and focusing on you know markets outside of the U.S. as well has made you a better U.S. investor? It's a great question. I actually, I think, I think so. I think like, I think there are things that you can learn from emerging markets, but but actually. I would say there's probably less of that and more of investing. We, we don't invest just in Africa, you know, we so right. about two thirds of our investments are in the US and then one third outside the US and outside the US. We've invested in Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, Kenya, Indonesia, Pakistan and India. And I think the other emerging markets are probably more helpful than the US investments. Yeah. And then um, you just read. So you, you just uh, closed a very big fund. Con- yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, any uh, interesting lessons or stories to tell from that experience? Yeah. Um, so it's it's our it's my third fund, um, the second fund as BTV. And, um, you know, the first two funds were really hard to raise. Yeah. The first fund, I had to f- pretend like I had a fund for a year and four months. I was calling it a fund, but it was really my own money and then it was almost all of my own money like i was just selling like there was stocks. no other money <laughs> there's no money left yeah. when i finally raised it yeah um and then even btv1 um which was about two years ago it took us almost a year to raise in full um and now th- part of that includes covid so there's something there but m- maybe it was like nine months of actual raising money um, and then this one is literally like a few weeks. So it was like a total change. I think we benefited greatly from the market being in a great spot, FinTech in particular. And then, you know, the past performance is looking really good now, mm-hmm. which had not fully shown its cards two years ago when we were raising. Mm-hmm. So I'm uh, doing the, the one sec. So, so I'm doing the sort of, uh, you know, niche podcast media, raise a small pre-seed fund on top. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately there's many who have come before me now to do it, maybe <laughs> yeah. not necessarily strictly Africa, uh, focused, but, um, as a, as a novice investor and somebody who, um, has never raised a fund, what advice do you have for me? Yeah. Well, first of all, like, I think the power of media is something that a lot of people recognize. And so I think I think it's actually a very good move that you're doing. I, I think especially like like a small fund where you can fit into rounds. People are going to want want you to be in rounds because you have a voice and or, or a megaphone probably is a better way to put it. Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. OK. Um, and advice would be, you know, I, I think um, try to you know let people know that you're doing this get um try to work with some vc funds and um try to get them to share a deal flow with you and and include you on stuff yeah that's the plan yeah anything um, anything else you want to talk about no this is great it's super fun lights back off again have you been to cape town before yeah okay a few Do you times. live there yeah cool yeah, i was gonna give you some Anything cool. else? What, what else are you thinking about? Anything else that's uh, sort of prickly, prickly thought right now? Doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be effort focused. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I'm just thinking about how we scale. We're like, um, like our fund is three full time people, um, and we like I'm seeing so much deal flow. I just don't have enough time. Yeah. E- even like from yesterday and today, the the tech summit, um, like I have like. 20 WhatsApps to respond to yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, I'm just like totally swamped. So thinking about how to scale ourselves. Mm-hmm. Do, you, what, of, do you have any answers for like, what do you think is the answer to that question? No, I mean, especially in emerging markets, it's tough. Um, we haven't quite figured out our plan. Um, I, so there, there are two GPs in the fund, myself and Jake, and um, I tend to do more of the emerging market stuff just because 
I I can more easily travel. Like Jake has kids, and it's just a little bit different. Um, so need to build out that side of of the team as well. Yeah. Anything else? No. We can leave it there. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, man.